What's funny about marriage? I don't mean what's ridiculous about marriage. What's funny about it? It's serious business. Back in 1991, uh, Harper published a book called Doesn't Anyone Blush Anymore? It's a book on relationships, and we'll be talking about it a little bit later. But I just want to mention that that title, which is a pretty good title, it worked, but it was not my choice. You see, the publisher always gets the final word on the title. But they ask you to submit suggestions. The title I preferred, the title I was fighting for, was Shut Up, I Love You. <laughs> and amazingly, in 1991, they thought Shut Up was too vulgar. Harper. <laughs> They thought it was too vulgar for a rabbi, I guess. But the, the meaning of the title is a very simple thing. We believe, we are taught to believe, that love will keep us together. And that all you really need is love. And if a marriage is floundering or if it's uh, difficult or there's friction, all you need is more love. And if you have a lot of love and it's not working, well, then you need more love. If you have enough love, everything will work. Of course, that's a bit Hollywood, Madison Avenue. Love sells, but it doesn't work. Love is not the answer to all our problems, because let's find out exactly what the problem is. The problem in most relationships, the problem in most marriages, is if I love you, what more can you want? So just shut up and let me love you. But no, you ruin it by having an opinion. <laughs> and a personality. What can I do? What can I do? No matter how much I love you, you won't shut up. <laughs> So, time after time, doing marriage counseling, I guess I am a little wise, because I gave up doing marriage counseling. <laughs> I got smart. But when I did do marriage counseling, time after time, it was the same problem. She says he doesn't love me. He says, of course I do. Now, is somebody lying? Is one of them mistaken? You try to find out who's telling the truth. They're both telling the truth. He loves her. That's why he doesn't understand why she also has to have an opinion. Isn't my love enough? So if you would just be quiet, give up your opinions and give up your personality and let me love you, we would both be so happy. She says, he doesn't love me because he doesn't listen to me. I gotta tell you the most common exchange in a difficult marriage. He says, I have been married to this woman for nine years and she's driving me crazy. I say, how is she driving you crazy? He says, I I can't figure out what she wants. I have no idea what she wants. It's driving me crazy. So naively, I turn to the wife and I say, you know, when you're married to a man for nine years, don't you think it's time to tell him what you want? What does she say? When, when, you've, when you've done some marriage counseling, you can basically sleep through the whole thing because you already know the script. <laughs> they follow the script perfectly. So it always happens. She says, tell him what I want. <laughs> I have told him a million times. <laughs> you know what he says. It follows the script. He says, what? Why did you tell me? What? 
she says, I've told you a million times, stop making fun of my sister. <laughs> he turns to me and says, you see, she makes me crazy. <laughs> I said, how is she making you crazy? She finally told you what she wants. He says, you don't believe that. You think that's what she wants? That's not what's bothering her. It bothers her that I make fun of her sister? It's not possible. Her sister's an idiot. <laughs> you see, it turns out that he has a sister, and she's an idiot. And he loves making fun of his sister, and he loves when others make fun of his sister, because she's an idiot. So he can't believe that his wife is sensitive to her idiot sister's dignity or reputation. So no, that can't be it. She doesn't really care about her sister, she's just trying to drive me crazy. We make assumptions. Because I am me, I see everything through my eyes. So if my wife says something that doesn't fit that picture, it does not compute. I simply dismiss it. No, that's not what you're caring. That's not what bothers you. I'll tell you what bothers you. That's the comedy of marriage. Two people living together under the same roof for the rest of their lives and they don't speak the same language. When he talks, she has no idea what he's saying. When she talks, he understands nothing. This is funny. And then they come to marriage counseling to try to figure out where, <laughs> where the relationship went wrong. So at the end of this whole thing, when they've each vented their frustrations, the guy says, so, you think we should get divorced? I hadn't heard anything they said because I just follow the script. And the answer to every problem and every marriage counseling session is the same. Should you get divorced? You are divorced. The question is, would you like to get married <laughs> to each other? How do we get married? There's a really profound and important teaching right at the beginning of the Torah in Bereshis. We have been misled seriously, dangerously, concerning the very nature, the fundamental, most earthy fact of life, the attraction of male to female and female to male. The whole idea of marriage Let me tell you a quick story if we have time. I came to Minnesota from Brooklyn, straight out of yeshiva, newly wed. And I was very excited about teaching, speaking, spreading Yiddishkeit. So I'm sitting by the phone waiting for, for a call. A call comes in, a teenage girl from a rural town outside of Minneapolis. She goes to a high school of 2,000 students and there are four Jewish kids in the whole school. Two of them are in her class, she and another girl, and their class is discussing intermarriage in a public school. I, I never found out why they were discussing intermarriage. But she says a priest had come to present the Catholic view and a minister had come to present the Protestant view, and these two Jewish kids would like to have a rabbi come and present the Jewish view on intermarriage, would I come? I said, would I come? That's what I'm here for. <laughs> so of course, yes, I'll come. She tells me the date and the place, fine. The day comes, and I'm thinking, what should I wear? High school, teenagers, no need to be formal. So I put on a leather jacket, a motorcycle jacket, and I go off to the appointment. 
This is really rural Minnesota. In the warm months, students come to school on horseback. I come into the classroom, and if you know the Yiddish expression, se welt mir finster vor der Augen. I am shocked and dismayed because the priest and the minister are both there. So this turns out to be one of those stories, a priest, a minister, and a rabbi. <laughs> but this actually happened. You know, a priest, a minister, and a rabbi walked into a bar, and the bartender said, is this some kind of joke? <laughs> but this one really happened. See, I had misunderstood. They hadn't already spoken. They had already agreed to speak. But the idea was that it was going to be a little panel of the, th of the three of us together. Now, in policy, we don't do that. We don't sit on panels with other religions. So had I known, I would have refused. But, you know, after I walked into the room, so I didn't know they were going to be there. They knew that a rabbi was coming, and for some strange reason, they were shocked when I showed up. This was not their picture of a rabbi. I think, for, I think in all reality, they had never seen a rabbi with a beard. Back then in Minnesota, rabbis didn't come with beards. And with a leather jacket, there was something incongruous about that. To make matters worse, the teacher comes over and says, we only have 45 minutes, like here. So each of you will speak five minutes. Five minutes? This is getting really ridiculous. And this is not legitimate. I'm not supposed to be here. So I'm very uncomfortable. They're old enough, the priest and the minister are old enough to be my father. And this is my first speaking engagement of my career. And it's all wrong. The priest spoke first, and in approximately five minutes, he said that intermarriage is forbidden, the church cannot sanction this marriage, you're not considered married, but if it does happen, you have to raise your children Catholic. About five minutes. The minister spoke about five minutes, and he said, marriages are difficult enough, Look at the divorce rate, look at the problems. The last thing you want to do is add another stress to the marriage by marrying somebody from a different faith, and he has some pamphlets to give out after class. Now it's my turn, I get up, and I panic. I am paralyzed. I can't think of anything to say, nothing. I hadn't actually prepared a speech. It's intermarriage. I know about these things. We, you know, we learned that in yeshiva. I didn't have to prepare a speech, so I didn't have a text to read from, and my mind just went completely blank. I could not think of a word to say. For firstly, because this whole thing was wrong, I wasn't supposed to be there, the whole setup, it was just a big mistake. Secondly, what should I say? It's forbidden, it's against the Torah. The Torah says you should not marry out. I'll sound like the priest. If I say psychologically, sociologically, it's not a good idea, you're not gonna understand each other, you're gonna, I'll sound like the minister. If I say, yeah, it's fine, go right ahead. <laughs> I'll lose my job. <laughs> anyway, I had nothing to say. I, complete, I went completely paralyzed. I couldn't think of a word. So I'll tell you what happens when you, when you get that, that way. There are 40 students waiting for you to speak. And your brain has nothing to offer. So what happens is your mouth starts to talk. Because <laughs> you have to. <laughs> so your mouth tar starts to talk. And your brain is thinking, uh, where are you going with this? <laughs> where, what's your point? So I find myself saying, I don't understand why we're discussing intermarriage. This is modern times. It's 1971. 
This is modern times in the 70s. Nobody bothers getting married anymore. So what's the difference? Intermarriage, there's no marriage. You live together, you like it, you stay, you don't like it, you leave. The priest got very upset. <laughs> he interrupted and he said, that's living in sin. I said, that's what's going on. So why are we discussing intermarriage? There's no marriage. Now these very innocent, clean cut, rural Minnesota teenagers, very politely start arguing with me, telling me why it's important to get married. One after the other, they're giving me arguments. One of them said, human beings are not meant to live alone. You need companionship. I said, of course you need companionship. All the companionship you want. One companion, two companions, yes, right. <laughs> But why marriage? A girl raises her hand and says, I get married because I want someone to support me. I said, why are you going to school? Get good grades, support yourself. One after the other is offering an argument and I'm dismissing it because I have nothing else to say. <laughs> Finally, one of them says, you know, when you have a baby, the baby has to have a mother and a father. And I'm going downhill without breaks. I have no idea what. I said, have babies? Nobody has babies anymore. <laughs> Haven't you heard of birth control? <laughs> Priest got very upset. <laughs> anyway, these kids are staring at me unbelieving and the two Jewish kids are cracking up <laughs> so finally the students said okay so why do we get married and I said I, I, I only reason I can think of is that way back when God told Adam and Chava Adam and Eve to be married and since then, with very few exceptions, people get married all over the world. It's the way we always heard it should be, so we marry. And then I thought of something to say. I said, whoa, whoa, now, that's why we don't intermarry. The whole purpose of marrying is because it's God's way. Well, if you're doing it because it's God's way, then do it the way he approves. Doesn't make sense to make a Seder on Pesach night and serve bread. The bell rings, the class is over. The minister comes over to me and says, can I walk you out to the car? <laughs> so we're walking and he's lost in thought. And it's a long corridor, you know, high school buildings. And I, I, I can't imagine what he wants to say, what he wants to ask. Finally, he says, in all earnestness, very serious, he says, what you were saying there in the classroom, is that from the Old Testament? <laughs> The comedy of marriage is that God invented it. It's a divine idea, not human. It's a divine idea that asks human beings to be something more than human. Now that's funny. You're gonna do something divine? What else do you do that's divine on a given day? God is asking us to do something divine. And what is divine about it? To get bigger than yourself. To be able to hear another person without imposing your own prejudices. If your wife is sensitive about her idiot sister, 
And we're not debating whether she's really an idiot, a big idiot, a little idiot. It doesn't matter. You got to hear what the other person is saying. If it bothers her when you make fun of her sister, then that is the biggest crisis in your life. And not only should you not make fun of her sister, but you should become the one to protect her sister from any ridicule or criticism. Because you're on her side. You're there to make her life better, easier, and more pleasant. This is a little uh, more than the human nature dictates. So we're asked to be divine. One of the reasons for marriage, I'm sure there are many, is that we have a whole list of qualities, virtues, good things about us that we may never use. How often do you have to be tolerant? How often do you have to be forgiving? How often do you have to be empathetic, sympathetic? How often do you have to sacrifice your comfort for someone else's? If you weren't married, hardly ever. But when you're married, every good quality you possess is going to be activated. You're going to need to use it. And that is the best part of marriage. When we resent that, then we've got the wrong idea of what marriage is. Marriage literally is a godly idea. It's not two people fell in love and decided to get married. Actually, modern version of marriage, I love you and you love me, well then let's get married. See, it doesn't even make any sense. That's not only funny, that's ridiculous. What has love got to do with it? I love you, you love me, well then let's get married. Doesn't make any sense. It's like, I love you and you love me, then we should live in Cleveland. <laughs> Why? How do you get to that conclusion? If I love you and you love me, we should be married. Who said anything about marriage? To make marriage work, it can't be a byproduct. If and when two people love each other, they get married. No, that's not how it works. For those of you who are single and you intend to get married, here's how you do it. Take out your calendar. Pick a realistic date. June of next year. Pick a day in June, mark it on your calendar, my wedding. Next date you go out on, the first thing you do is you pull out your calendar. <laughs> and you say, I am scheduled to be married. <laughs> I'm scheduled to be married in June, June 14th to be exact. If he says, of which year, <laughs> go home. Not for you. If he says, June 14th, that's amazing. He takes out his calendar and says, I'm scheduled for June 12th. So let's compromise and get married June 13th. This is a match made in heaven. If you want to be married, it's because you believe in marriage. You love marriage. And if you love marriage, you schedule it like you do every other important thing in your life. You put it on your calendar. Now it's just a matter of a technicality and finding someone to do it with. See, now that's a Jewish way of getting married. It's not, uh, if I fall in love, I'll get married. I'm getting married. It's scheduled. And I'm doing it because marriage is divine, because marriage is holy, because marriage is right. Because since I've been nine, 
I've wanted to be married. Not to someone. <laughs> I just wanted to be married. That's a natural thing. So when you find someone who shares your thinking about marriage, that's why you marry him or her. Do you love them? Maybe. Maybe not yet. But you've got the same vision. You have the same life. And if you get married, you will support each other in that life. That's good. That's marriage. So here's the bottom line. Marriage doesn't need justification. You get married because, because of marriage, not because of love. Marriage doesn't need an excuse. It's the right thing to do. It's the only way to live. So you get married. Who do you marry? Someone who shares your idea of marriage. That's qualification number one. You match your vision, your picture of life. And if they match well, this is a good marriage. So you come to the marriage with a picture of what life is supposed to be. Two people with the same picture, get married. When you do, and your life starts to unfold, to blossom, together with each other, how could you not love the person who is making your life livable, meaningful, complete, full? So, there's a lot of humor in marriage, as there is in life in general. We have to remain light because you're trying to do something superhuman. Don't take yourself so seriously. You're trying to be bigger than yourself, and that's clumsy. You've never had to do that before. So you're trying. You'll make some mistakes, but you've got to maintain a sense of humor, while at the same time, there is nothing funny about the marriage itself. The people trying to be married can be very funny because people are funny. Marriage is not. So all those jokes about husbands and wives, nasty. Shouldn't tell those jokes. They're not nice. You can make fun of people, people's weaknesses, foibles, but not of marriage. Hey, this perfect story. It's in the book. I was a teenager talking to one of my teachers in yeshiva, a very wise man, a truly wise man. We were standing on the street, and this newlywed couple rushed over to him. He was also the rabbi of the community. And the wife says, Rabbi, isn't it true you're not allowed to ladle soup out of a pot on Shabbos while it's on the fire? Tell my husband, he doesn't know. And this teacher of mine says, whoa, whoa, slow down, slow down. Tell, tell me again, what's the question? Ladling soup out of a pot? You mean like with a ladle? She says, yeah. He says, uh, from the pot that's on the fire? She says, yes. He says, on Shabbos? She says, yes. He says, boy, that's complicated. Let me go home and look it up. Call me later, I'll tell you whether you're allowed or not. So they walked away. And I'm staring at him, like, what am I missing here? You're not allowed to cook on Shabbos. A pot standing on the fire is cooking. If you ladle soup out of it, you're stirring the pot. Stirring is an act of cooking. So of course you're not allowed. Every kid in yeshiva knows that. So I said to him, what am I missing? <laughs> Why didn't you tell her she's right? He says, and make the husband look bad in his wife's eye? You're not allowed to do that. I was, com I was completely in awe. He did it so naturally, so spontaneously, 
exaggerated the question, acted dumb to preserve the respect that a wife has for her husband. That's the sanctity of marriage. That's how we should treat marriage. When you're in the presence of a married couple, you're in the presence of something holy. It's like a congregation at Kol Nidre. You're careful what you say. If you can enhance their respect for each other, if you can help them admire each other or appreciate each other, that is the ultimate mitzvah of bringing shalom bias to a married couple. To diminish their respect for each other has got to be the biggest sin. So we've got to stop telling all these nasty jokes. Make fun of men, make fun of women, but not of husbands and wives. So a joke like this guy was traveling with his secretary and they were in a city and they were looking for a hotel and all the rooms were booked. There was nothing available. There was a convention in town and there was no rooms available. Finally, they found one little motel that had a room, but there was only one bed. Not having a choice, they took it. So they're in bed and the, guy, the w woman says to the, uh, to the guy, the secretary says to her boss, it's a little chilly, can you get the other blanket, the spare blanket? He says, you know, as long as we're here spending the night together, why don't we make believe we're married? She says, okay. He says, just for tonight, let's make believe we're a married couple. He's, she says, okay. He says, uh, so, so we're married, right? She says, yeah. He says, okay, then get your own blanket. <laughs> See, such jokes should never be told. It's a nasty joke. Don't make fun of marriage. So, on the one hand, we have to appreciate the comedy of human beings with all our failings, with all our weaknesses, trying to do something divine. And on the other hand, we have to appreciate how divine the marriage really is. And when we do it right, when we follow the laws of modesty and dignity, when we speak to each other the way it ought to be, when husband and wife don't shout at each other from different rooms in the house. First time I heard that, it was, it was shocking to me. I've never heard my father call to my mother from a different room. When he wanted to talk to her, he went to where she was. And for many years, we didn't even know what my mother's name was. Because <laughs> he never called her. He always went to her to speak to her. So if we watch our tone using the right tone, the appropriate tone. You know, there are tones. The tone you use speaking to an employer, the tone the employer uses in speaking to the employee, the tone you use speaking to your parents, the tone you use speaking to your children. There's a tone appropriate for every occasion. There's a tone appropriate for husband and wife. Every other tone, inappropriate. And children are particularly sensitive to this. When your children hear you speak to each other in the right tone, you're, you're basically setting them on the right path for life. If they hear the wrong tone, it disturbs their whole foundation. So, let's keep laughing at ourselves trying to be married, but let's take marriage very seriously because it is the holiest thing human beings are capable of. Make sense?